We're going to go, go, go. Um, admit. Herman. Hey, Brad, how you doing? I'm, I'm doing fine, except for uh, we've been talking about you nonstop. I'm, I'm into it with uh, Sisson and my other uh, confidants. And mm -hmm. uh, it's, um, it, it's we're, our, our minds are getting blown. Cool. You're, you're messing with the entire fit, the foundation of the fitness industry and the, the gimmicky diet industry with your, re, with your life's work and validated <laughs> research. Good. I, I don't mind messing with those people. That's fine. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, you got to swing hard. I, I guess in academia too, you you got to you know you got to be legit, and you come and do a presentation, and maybe the yeah. maybe the other person at the conference has a different point of view, and it's like, come on now, this is this yeah. is this is high stakes. I guess so, man. You know what I love about doing science is that um, the data wins. You know, hmm. so yeah. we get to we get to show you know that's that's what the peer reviewed literature is all about, as boring as it is. And nobody ever goes, you know, too much into it unless you're in the field. But that's kind of where, uh, you know, that, that's where the rubber hits the road, man. Uh, you just titled the podcast, by the way. Um, <laughs> we 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 started recording. We don't need we don't we don't need any small talk with this guy. And the data wins. Uh, so right. that that reminds me. So you're you're in the field. Is that kind of rare? Like, is it one out of ten people who are actually heading out into the into the wild lands of the planet to do their research. And then there's other people that are in ivory towers looking at your research, not, not to criticize it, but I'm saying yeah. your role is a certain, you have a certain contribution to, to science and to uh, the academic mm -hmm. community that you exist in. Are other people have a disparate role and a, a whole different scene? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the ecosystem kind of gets divvied up by people who do more sort of lab or bench work and people who do more uh, field work. Um, you know, like out in the, you know, out in the field. Um, we try to do both, which I think is a, is a strength of, of my research group. Uh, but yeah, I, certainly in the nutrition world, you know, there's plenty of people who have much larger budgets and much bigger groups to go and, and measure, you know, the particulars of any dietary intervention or any exercise intervention, right? And they can do these for 16 months and they've got enormous labs full of people and postdocs and everybody. And, and they do that very, those very well. And, and I've certainly, you know, integrated those insights and those data and everything, but, um, but they're not going to go out and live with a Hadza for a few months. So I guess that's what I, I bring to the table. <laughs> oh man. Okay. So the listeners uh, are going to be strongly encouraged to listen to our previous show about your wonderful book, Burn. Uh, but what, what's happened in the aftermath is I've been bombarding you with emails, hopefully uh -huh. thoughtful enough that you actually answered and agreed to come back on. But you know, this, this insight, uh, we need to take a deep breath here. Mm -hmm. and realize the ramifications of it uh, as, as applied to the, uh, the conventional model of the fitness industry and, and the diet industry. And so if we have this constrained amount of uh, calorie burning and mm -hmm. there's a great graph, uh, did you make that graph, the, the constrained model versus the additive model? All the or, stuff in that book is, is, all the graphs and everything are mine. So, yep. Yeah. So we have this idea of, that, uh, that calorie burning is constrained and I think if, to help me understand, one of the insights that really hits home is when you compare us to the gorilla. And so, hmm. you know, we're homo sapiens. We have different lifestyles. Some people ride the subway and, and sit in front of a screen and ride the subway back and watch Netflix. Um, but we're all in the same species. Thereby, we're, you know, we're, we're constrained first and foremost uh, as humans. And, and then, then we're going to talk about, you know, lifestyle and, and diet and exercise. Yeah, that's right. I mean, every, every species has its own like trajectory through time and space, you know, and, and we've ended up where we are. We have higher metabolic rates than other apes do. So the other apes are the, you know, chimps, bonobos, gorillas, and orangutans. Orangutans are actually hypometabolic. They're, they have low metabolic rates. They burn about half the calories we do uh, for the same body size and activity level. Um, we're higher than chimpanzees and bonobos. Uh, but you know, it's interesting that we're the, we're the highest metabolic rate ape, which means if you control for body size, body composition, lifestyle, all of it, we're burning energy at about 20% more per day than chimpanzees and bonobos, which are the closest, our closest relatives. And yet, even though we have these high metabolic rates, we're also the fattest apes. 
because, you know, <laughs> pair, paired with that high metabolic rate, right, has been selection for a bit of a reserve gas tank, right? Because, you know, you, you can't, again, the, the, well, this is really fun for me. I, I love to talk, I could talk about this forever, but the evolutionary biology of metabolism is that, you know, you are kind of parked at this place where, you know, evolutionarily you've been able to get that much energy in and you make the use of all of it out. And maybe that's in activity or maybe it's in reproduction. Ultimately, evolution cares about reproduction. Um, but wherever you get parked, that's kind of where it's hard to move from that. You know, lifestyle doesn't have a big effect on where you are relative to where you get parked by evolution. Um, and we often think like, well, if you, if you burn more calories and you ought to be less fat, but actually we're also more fat because we got parked at a high place. We're parked at a high metabolic rate. So we need that extra gas tank to kind of help us, you know, get through any lean times. Uh, uh, is it possible that in 150,000 years of our sorry ass modern lifestyle, we're going to evolve to, yeah, to burn but, fewer you know, calories the, or something? I think that's possible. Um, now, the way that that's going to happen is not going to make anybody happy. <laughs> because the way that evolution happens is the uh, mm. people who don't fit as well mm. are sick and don't have kids. You know, they, they're unhealthy and for whatever reason or not successful in terms of reproduction um, and they don't have kids. And so, um, or their kids don't do well. That's the other thing that can happen. Uh, so, you know, there's not going to be, it won't be a happy story of, of, uh, of evolution. It never is. Well, actually, if we've mitigated a lot of that, we can still tee up an, a, a sickly eighteen-year-old uh, to reproduce. So maybe, yeah. m maybe we don't have that potential to evolve ever again because we're we're so smart that we we neutralized evolutionary forces, selection pressures. Yeah, you could you could spin it different ways. I can tell you that um, it's it's unlikely that. I mean, first of all, kind of any sort of you know governmental planning for who should reproduce that we, we know that that's a terrible idea. <laughs> we, we know that that's, that's ugly and, and eugenics and, and gets really bad really fast. Uh, so sort of trying to make that happen would be really dangerous, but even letting it happen um, or hoping medicine kind of takes care of, you know, takes smooths out the edges of it. I don't know. I think it's a tough ride. I think the better idea is to try to pull the, you know, what, what we know keeps us healthy because it's how we kind of evolved to be healthy. Keep those, get those principles back into our lives. I think that's mm -hmm. a faster way to get there. Yeah, more humane way to get there. Kind of reverse it. Well, we're on a, we're on a bell curve. We want to go back to our, our yeah. human roots. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Okay. So back to the, this calorie idea um, and, and isolating as homo sapiens uh, is helpful. And then um, when we're looking at um, the, the, the constrained daily energy burning. Um, first we throw in the brain, mm. which burns what 20% of our total daily calories, 20% of our resting calories. Anyhow. Yeah. Um, I guess it depends on if you think about exactly the, the number there, but yeah, it's about 20% of our resting, I think, cause it's 300 calories a day. Yeah. And you burn about 1500 calories at rest. So yep. About 50, about 20% of resting calories are for your brain, which means every fifth breath you take is the oxygen <laughs> for your brain. <laughs> um that sting could rename his song every fifth breath you take <laughs> yeah i love it now i think you mentioned this already but the variation in brain caloric expenditure is minimal whether you're sitting on the beach uh, staring at the at the flat yeah. scenery or in, engrossed in an eight hour uh exam for your uh for your uh, doctorate level studies yeah as far as we know thinking as hard as you can think <laughs> doesn't change the, that doesn't move the dial very much. Maybe, maybe about four calories an hour, I think is the best four kilocalories an hour, I should say is the best uh, measure so far. So if you have a good knife, you cut the M&M &M in half, right? Isn't, <laughs> isn't, isn't the M&M &M your go-to reference point? For, yeah, I love it yeah. because everybody's had M&Ms, you know? So um, I, one M&M &M is about half an four M &M, kilocalories. But, yeah. Oh, okay. One M&M. &M. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that that um, that puts the bowl that's been been mm. demoed to shame on the uh, on the desk in our busy day in the office. Okay, yeah, that's so, right. That's right. Now, what about the other organs in a resting state? Um, there's there's some good research to mm -hmm. uh, certify that. Uh, well, I mean, the muscles are burning energy during exercise, but mm -hmm. they're burning a huge amount of our our, our daily calorie pie at rest too. Uh, yeah, a fair amount, just because there's so much of them. Uh, pound for pound, your muscles are not as quiet as fat, definitely, but not quite as expensive um, as other organs. So your big costly organs are your brain, like we said, which you know basically runs a 5K every day, right? 300 calories a day. 
Uh, your liver, which is about the same, actually, your liver does about that much work. Oh. Um, your intestinal, your gut, your GI tract, uh, particularly after you've eaten, um, all those, you know, the, 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 the cells of your GI tract are busy getting the enzymes, you know, and, and cutting up all that stuff and, and getting it transported, actively transported through the intestinal wall. Um, kidneys are really active. Uh, your heart, your heart's a muscle, so it doesn't special, you know, compared to other muscles, but it's contracting all the time rhythmically. Right. Mm. So it ends up, at, uh, it adds up to a lot of energy. Um, so yeah, so those are the big ones, liver, heart, brain, and, uh, kidneys and GI tract, uh, muscles at rest. Yep. Kidneys. So we're, 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 we're filling in this pie, whether we exercised or not, which I think is the takeaway. Yeah. I want the listeners to really, uh, embrace. Right. And then, um, if we, uh, as distinguished from our next door neighbor, go out there and actually do run a 5k, Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you can walk us through what happens to that, that big number at the end of the, um, at the end of the calculation. Yeah. So, uh, the way that people, we, we usually think about energy expenditure is we, we do the math like you and I've been doing, we add up all our organ costs and then we have the energy cost. We know it is to run a mile or run a 5k. We add that to it and we think, okay, we just add all those up. And it's like a grocery bill at the end of the day. Those are our kilocalories per day. And that's how any online calculator for your energy expenditure works, for example. Um, but we know it's more complicated than that because actually the numbers that we're talking about with things like um, your liver uh, and, and actually whole systems that we haven't talked about, like your immune system, um, your stress reactivity system, um, reproductive system, um, other aspects of your body, they follow a really strong circadian rhythm and they respond to stresses throughout the day. And so what you think of as sort of your organs energy expenditure or your organ systems energy expenditure, um, you know, we can, we can give these numbers like 300 calories a day for your brain or 300 calories a day for your liver, but that's, that's like kind of at baseline. Now your brain doesn't go up and down very much. That's true, but the rest of your organ systems do. And particularly, um, you know, your, so you have a circadian rhythm to everything, right? Um, testosterone level starts off high in the morning by evening is much lower for example, right? Okay, so what happens is if you take that 5K run, and especially if you start doing that repeatedly, so your body gets used to that level of, of workload, you will adjust, is what seems to be happening, it, seems, it adjusts the other expenditure and other, other systems to make room for that uh, higher level of, of running, right? So, so day to day, you might go up and down, right? Because if you run a marathon tomorrow, but you didn't today, then you burn more calories tomorrow than you did today, fine. Um, so it's not like your body is, is making these adjustments on the fly, second by second. That's not happening. But the overall circadian rhythm and background energy expenditure that your body is used to doing, as well as uh, stress reactivity, for example, your reaction to stressful stimuli, those do get modulated by physical activity. If I'm more physically mm -hmm. active, my circadian rhythm kind of gets damped down to make room for that activity. My stress reactivity to stressful stimuli gets damped down. My cortisol levels go up less. My epinephrine goes up less. My you know, adrenaline gets less. And all of those things seem to be saving energy so that um, you know, in my, in my, a sedentary person or the person who's running that 5K every couple of days end up having the same total energy expenditure per day. I might've gone through that a little bit too fast or too much, but I, that, that's the idea. Right, so the, the person uh, running around the office in a hectic, uh, frenzied state um, that didn't do the 6 a.m. spinning class. Mm -hmm. And then the, the chill person, the, the athletic person in the office, who's just uh, just breezing down the hall to get another pack of post-it notes and then breezing right. back to their desk. Um, it's they're, they're, the, 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 the frenzied person is catching up to the spinning class that they blew off because they slept in. Yeah, I mean, that, that's one way to think about it. The other way to think about it is, you know, you've got two people in the boardroom, right? And they both get up to give, to say what they have to say, to give their report, you know? And that's, that's a great example of uh, what we'd call a Trier social stress test. Public speaking always gets people's heart rate up. Mm. And even if you feel really cool about it and calm about it, your body still does a little bit of that fight and flight response. This has been measured in lots of studies. Heart rate goes up because your adrenaline's going up. Cortisol levels go up, right? Both of those reactions cost you energy. Now, there's two people in the boardroom, one who exercises all the time, 
one who is much more sedentary. The person who exercises all the time, her response is going to be blunted. Cortisol level is not going to go up so much. Adrenaline level is not going to go up so much. And they're both going to recover back to baseline faster. The person who gave that report and doesn't exercise all the time is going to feel a bigger burst. It's going to experience a bigger burst of cortisol, a bigger burst of adrenaline. And it's going to take longer for them to come back down to baseline because their body isn't used to spending its energy on activity. And so isn't sort of making that room damping down those reactions compared to the person who is exercising all the time and their body has damped those reactions down. Uh, I guess that would be on the list of benefits to getting Absolutely. regular exercise, Absolutely. assuming it's conducted properly. Cause I don't want to be that guy that I have been that overtrains to the extreme and everything's damped down to where I don't feel like uh, my, my famous example was I, I lived um, six tenths of a mile from the mailbox for a while. <laughs> and I drove there every single day because I was too tired from my 84 mile bike ride to pedal another 0.6. Oh, and then back is 1.2. You know, it was just oh, ridiculous, but yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so if, we, if a properly conducted exercise program is in place there, uh, you're a more chill person and you don't uh, abuse the stress response. Mm -hmm. Same thing. And the same thing for the immune system, right? Mm. That person who is, you know, regularly exercises. So their body has adjusted to that level of exercise regularly in their life their background inflammation level is gonna be lower too, okay? And what's your immune, it, it, chronic inflammation is your immune system run amok. It's your immune system on all the time, right? When it doesn't have to be. So like, we, we, all, we all want a fire department, right? We all wanna be able to call 911 and mm -hmm. the fire department comes and, and saves our home. We don't want the fire department to be parked in our driveway every morning, spraying down the house for no reason, right? That's background inflammation. That, that's that chronic inflammation is, your, is the fire department never goes home. Um, the person who's exercising regularly, they don't have that problem, that inflammation at a high level all the time. The person in the boardroom in this scenario that, that doesn't exercise is really sedentary. Their inflammation levels are going to be higher. Um, and we, we know this. We've known this for a long time. And I think what the constrained energy idea says is this is why. This is your body managing how it spends its energy. And so it kind of gives a coherent framework to all these individual observations that we've seen over the years of doing research on people who exercise versus don't, the benefits of exercise. A, a constrained energy model kind of helps put those all together into a coherent, oh, this is why, this is how. So we know there's all these different triggers for chronic inflammation, uh, adverse lifestyle practices, but I, I'm not clear that, is it, is it also lack of exercise can promote chronic inflammation? Yeah. Yeah. So we know that people who exercise a lot have lower um, and not over exercise. We're not talking right. about people who exercise regularly and, and, and responsibly, I guess. Um, yeah. Have lower levels of inflammation than people who don't all, th all other things, you mm -hmm. know, equal um, yeah. other people's labs have shown this. My lab is in a, the middle of an analysis showing this uh, looking at the NHANES data set in the U S um, this is a, this is a well-known thing. The inflammation is one of the, the you know, lower inflammation is one of the big benefits of, of exercise. And there's other things you can do too that will help you, you know, minimize inflammation, but exercise is a big one. Right. I mean, on the checklist, we have get, get enough sleep, uh, eat, eat the right foods, get rid of the junk foods, don't mm -hmm. over-exercise. And yep. now uh, adding to the list, don't, don't under-exercise, don't sit around all day. Right. Right. Don't pollute uh, and, yourself, you know, don't, don't yeah, smoke. Right. <laughs> so is that just due to the genetic disconnect when you compare contrast the Hadza who are always on the move and, and doing all these wonderful things for their body versus we're not really designed to sit in a chair for eight hours? Yeah, I think that's one of the reasons that the Hadza are so darn healthy, you know, no heart disease, uh, no diabetes. Uh, and it's, it's because, you know, they don't have these cardiometabolic risk factors that we did. They're, they're getting their exercise every day. It doesn't hurt that they're outside all the time. You know, I think we can also focus on the fact that they've got family connections, friendship connections that they have their whole lives. They're not, you know, they don't have the kind of social, so, you know, psychosocial stresses that we have as much. They have their own set of stresses, but they're not the kind of, you know, the ones that we face so much loneliness, disconnection, inequality that we have in the States, for mm -hmm. example. Uh, so we, we hear all about 
the importance of that cardio, the low level cardio, moving around, getting up from your desk and moving. Do you see the Hadza doing any explosive activity for any reason? I, I can't imagine there'd be an artificial reason like a sprint race uh, no. on the fourth, the fourth week of the, uh, the, the sunny, rainy month. But um, yeah. is, there, is there any need, you know, we're, we're romanticizing the, the, the primal paleo thing where we had to run away from the saber tooth tiger. Uh, yeah. and so sprinting is really great for the human to, to build up those muscles and, and burst the adaptive hormones, right. but, uh, down in, down in Africa, what do those guys have going? Well, so, the, you know, the Hadza don't run from predators. Uh, the, the predators <laughs> run from them. You know, right, yeah. uh, the, the Hadza can kick a pride of lions off of a kill. You know, we, we've been in camps where they've done that. So um, they, they're kind of the top predators there. Now, of course, a, you know, a single guy or woman out there can get surprised or whatever by a predator. Sure. I mean, that, that can happen. And in those rare cases, maybe once in a lifetime. Um, sure. Then they, they would run. Of course they would. They would probably uh, but, lose you know, it's not though, happening all the time. They, they'd probably get eaten, too. They're not going to. There's beat a good them. chance of that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I wonder where this uh, romanticizing came from that um, humans should be out there uh, you know, doing these uh, these amazing CrossFit uh, accomplishments in the name of yeah. health. I mean, not not to, you know, I, I'm I'm obsessed with high jumping because it improves my life and I love it and I feel like it's delaying the aging process, but yeah. it may be not honoring my ancestors like we like we think. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that there's. They do stuff that requires real strength as well. You know, men climb up into trees to get wild honey or chop into tree limbs. I mean, that, that's hard work. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like powerlifting kind of work, but it's it's hard. You know, it's body weight kind of stuff. Um, digging for tubers in rocky ground, that's hard work. Mm. But um, explosive kind of, no, nah, I, I, I don't see it with them. You know, and it's not just the Hadza, I should say. that I have got good colleagues who work with groups in South America. Um, we have another project going on right now in Northern Kenya with a, a group called the Dasa, the Dasnich, uh, which are a pastoralist group. You know, I, I'm, I'm, my friend and colleague network is full of people who work with small scale societies all over the globe. And the running from the tiger thing doesn't, doesn't really come up, you know, cause humans are kind of become the dominant player on the landscape, mm. uh, kind of immediately upon becoming part of that landscape, you know, that we're, mm -hmm. we're so so yeah, I, I don't know where that ran. I would just chalk that up to the list of many romanticized things about the past that that turn out not to really be true. <laughs> right. So if if we drafted the the best uh, primitive living hunter gatherer and and took him into uh, the high school varsity track meet, they'd they'd get crushed at anything from a hundred to a mile, probably. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. I mean, I think they would also wonder what the hell we are bothering to do. But uh, you know. Um, <laughs> The, uh, you get good at what you train at, you know, and nobody would be able to beat them in archery or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the tasks that they do, mm -hmm. um, nobody could outwalk them. Um, but yeah, unless if you don't train for that stuff, of course, you're not going to be very good at it. Yeah. Um, so I guess, uh, we're just, we're just having fun and, um, yeah. kind of advancing the sophisticate, just like someone who's painting a painting, um, is there's no, there's no need for that in a, in a way, but same with the extreme fitness endeavors, it's just kind of, uh, advanced life yeah. and the ability to do something that's rewarding in certain ways. Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I love rock climbing and mountaineering, for example. Um, there are very good reasons not to do those things. For example, right. you know, gravity, gravity is a great reason not to go <laughs> rock climbing. Um, it, but I love it, you know, and, and I've given that some thought, like, why do I love this thing that clearly was not it's not adaptive in any obvious way. Um, but you know, one of the side effects of having these big, crazy brains is this life of the mind and this feeling that life is more than just the pragmatic day-to-day -day mm. stuff. And it's, you know, um, and that we all live for that kind of experience that gets us feeling alive and gets us connected. And if, if that is running, you know, intervals down at the track, then awesome, go do it. You know, and if that's, you know, doing a, a Iron Man, then do it, you know, um, listen to your body. If you're feeling off, then okay, then maybe back off. But like, those are all great things. Just like, like you say, painting a picture or playing the piano. I mean, yeah. Okay. So now, now let me put you on the spot. Uh, all of the future of the human race is all uh, in your hands and <laughs> it's a, a longevity contest. Mm. So you're going to have to leave your academic career 
uh, we're going to pay you a million zillion trillion dollars also. Uh, yeah. But you need to get to the world record finish line. Uh, what would you what would you put into place? Would you become the the CrossFit Games regional champion, or would you just walk more and uh, whatever else would be thrown in there? Would you sleep fourteen hours a day instead of eight? Or uh, from your research right. and uh, just a just a fun question here. No, yeah, no pressure. No pressure, to, man. Yeah, yeah. And if I I win, if I live the longest, is that the deal? Uh, well, the future of humanity is, you know, depending on you getting to, let's say, 110, because now Oof. you can put all the resources you need. You can uh, enlist right. any experts on your team. Right. And here we go. Well, um, I've never been asked that question before. So you win a prize for that. Congratulations. Um, the here's here's my answer, I guess, on the spot. I am on the spot. Um, I'm, I think I model the Hadza in a way but I don't cause play as a hunter gatherer, right? I get to keep my clothes and my, my climate controlled house. Um, but here's what I, what I put into my life that I'm probably not doing enough of right now. I make sure that I'm active every day and that I'm active for like, you know, a couple hours every day, at least maybe more. And I do as much of that as I can outside. Um, I try to make sure that I'm connected to friends and family in a way that's meaningful. Right, so I don't get isolated and sad because that will not be good for me either. And I uh, eat foods that I buy in the produce and the meats section of my supermarket. You know, I stay away from anything processed, uh, especially. I mean, I, I would probably still eat pasta and bread, but I stay away from anything that comes in a packet with a ready-made sauce. You know what I mean? And any of the snack stuff. And I, and I, I grimace and cut out beer and uh the occasional sugary beverage too gosh that's what about your the, mental health tough. man the, the the popping open a beer after i after know a tough three-hour work day because you'd, you'd go back from eight hours to three hours that's right well maybe i keep the occasional beer can i do that we'll see and then um and then i start getting myself genotyped uh intensively to figure out how I can crisper in all the good, <laughs> the good genes, because we know that that longevity is also quite heritable, right? So your likelihood of uh, of living to hundred uh, is like five times or ten times higher if you have a relative who's lived to hundred. Really? Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. Um, um, but, and but then you, you just what's that? If you if you stop on that one for a second, yeah, and you have uh, you know maybe not the best genes for longevity, but you but you turn your lifestyle practices in a different direction than all of your ancestors who succumbed yeah. to white flour and sugar that came in the industrial age. Um, couldn't you transcend that? Or is there something in the genes that's, that, that's beyond lifestyle practices? So, okay, let's unpack this a little bit. Let's talk about when we think about nature versus nurture for any trait, okay? Uh, nobody would be surprised to learn that, you know, the, however tall your parents grew, or the height of your parents is pretty predictive of your height, right? Um, also, nobody would be surprised to learn that your nutritional environment growing up also affects your height, mm. right? And whether or not you got sick as a kid and um, other, other social stress can even stunt kids growth. And so we understand height really well and kind of intuitively as this uh, interaction between our genes and our environments. And we know that we kind of can't pull them, no, no kid grows up without an environment. And so you kind of can't pull those things apart super easily for any one individual, but we know that they're both at play all the time. Um, if I want a kid to reach his full height potential, then I can feed him super well and make sure he doesn't get sick and I could do all the right things, but I still can't make somebody whose parents are both five foot zero, seven feet tall. That's really unlikely, right? And uh, so, and, and vice versa. I can't make a really tall person is inherently going to be tall. It's hard for me to make that person very short. Uh, I, I, for all the evidence points to the longevity being the same kind of thing, um, that we wow. do have variability in the genetics that, that seem to dictate how long we last. Um, we're all, you know, in the same way that humans are all sort of between five and six and a half feet tall, more or less. Right. Yeah. I mean, it seems like a broad range to us, but we're nobody's as tall as a giraffe and nobody's as small as a mouse. Right. There's a, a human range of heights. There's a human range of age spans that we can hope to get to if we stay healthy. Nobody's going to live to be 200 as far as we can mm -hmm. tell. Nobody, you know, has, it, people don't tend to fall apart at 30. 
right? We tend to mm-hmm. fall apart in the, our older ages, what we call older ages. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that there's, you know, we, we can and should do everything we can to, to improve our environments. But if to ignore a genetic background would be like mm-hmm. ignoring the genetics of height, of course, some people are going to be taller than others, right? I don't know. So that's, that's how I would answer that question. Um, and I don't know that we know enough about the genetics of it yet to do anything about it. Right. It's one thing to say it's heritable. It runs in families. Mm. We can find these genes that seem to be related. It's another thing to say, now I'm going to manipulate that gene and fix it. That's a harder, that's a much harder thing to do. Uh, so you'd, you'd go in for some appointments to see if they could manipulate your genes. But so far, your <laughs> list, um, it's, it's, not too, it's not too troubling. You're going to get outside and, and be active for a couple hours a day. Uh, you're going to be connected with friends and family. So you're probably not even going to move from your, your existing house and your, your Saturday soccer game schedule. And you're going to eat uh, the, the clean, you know, wholesome foods from the grocery store. Mm-hmm. Um, what, else, what else do we have on this list? That's it, man. Then we give it a ride. <laughs> see how it goes. <laughs> right. And then uh, form the intention that uh, everyone's counting on you. And so you're, you're going to come through for us. That's right. I say, what do you do? You speak it into existence. I'm going to live to be 110. Right. Well, I'm, I'm uh, you know, um, firmly believe that's a big part of it. And I, I'm, my goal is 123 because the current record's 122, Jean that's Calment. Right. And so it's easy as one, two, three. Just, just believe it for, you know. Yeah, maybe I'll, maybe I'll have a party when I'm 61 and a half, right? I'm, I'm that's my that's my midlife point Halfway there. Halfway there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so Herman's got it dialed, people. It's it's easy. We, we can all <laughs> we can all sign up for the plan now. We can all go to 110, whatever. Sure, sure. Let's do it. Wait, let's see how much does that cost? Uh, outside outdoor activity in the sun. So far, nothing there. Family and friends might have to pop for some plane tickets if yeah. if your kids go off to college someday. And then the meat and produce. There you go. There's butcher box discounts right now for listening to the show. I mean, this is this is easy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so uh, this is my like c- coming back at you with a, with a tough uh, question from the audience mm. at the at the conference. Um, you know, here's the athlete athlete goes and, and trains harder and gets leaner and, and kicks butt and, and meets goals. Mm-hmm. And uh, how does that layer into this constrained model of calorie burning when yeah. there's, there seems to be this anecdotal evidence that if I can up my mileage from 150 to 300 on the bike, uh, yeah. my quads are going to be bursting out of my legs. There's veins okay. everywhere. And I got a six pack. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so a couple of things there. One is if you, of course, if you do resistance exercise or even a lot of hard in, endurance exercise like cycling, your muscles are going to respond and, and hypertrophy. You're going to grow muscle mass. Sure. Uh, that's fine. Um, and when you're on a block, you know, when you're in your training mode and maybe you've had a bit of a rest season and now you're going to hit it and you're just going to crush it for a while and your body hasn't made that adjustment yet, or maybe you're even above where your body could possibly adjust because you can, you can push it up above that ceiling for a while. You'll come back down eventually, but you can push it up there for a while. So the Tour de France does that to you, for example, right? Uh, so they're above the ceiling for a while. They're burning yeah. They're I mean, they, they test them. They're burning 7,000 calories a day or whatever oh, yeah. they're burning. Yeah, That's yeah. insane. Uh, yeah. But then what happens when they, when they come back down? Yeah, you have to, you're going to, your body is going to make you balance that out with a rest period. And either that's because you'll take a rest period because you're being mm. smart. Or well, one will be you'll, taken you'll for out. you. Yes, yeah. people. One will be taken for you. I'm very familiar with that concept. Yeah, yeah. I was talking to a, a guy in the UK who is a sports scientist for a couple of, of uh, cycling teams that have raced in uh, that race the Tour de France. You know, race the the, the series, the the Tour and the Giro and the uh, Vuelta. Um, and those, you know, he says those guys they they can race one. You know, you probably know this as well if you're a, at all a fan, but those guys can really push and really race one race. And then the rest of it, the whole of the season, they mm. are not, you know, they're not going to be competitive. They're not going to even really try to be competitive. Um, you know, they'll be part of the crew and they'll be, you know, they'll, they'll help the other guys out. Right. But you can't do that to your body and max out for a month and then even take like the month off that they have and then do it again. It just doesn't work that way. And you have to have a, re- you know, they have a, a whole off season too, from like October through, what is it? March. Maybe people, people listening probably know better than I do. And I don't know how much of that is, is just purely off and how much of that is just low level, but you have to have that because your body, you know, if you think about averaging this out over the course of a year, 
the energy expenditure has to stay kind of near that ceiling that everybody's behind underneath because we're all humans. That is, that is the kind of the ceiling, you know? Uh, so we can uh, maybe better understand this with expanding the timeline a bit yeah. outside of a day and every single day this is happening, but maybe it's if we look at our week or our month and yeah. that's the part where um, I think we can all relate when you go out there and have a big uh, eight hour hike uh, to the top of the mountain, the next day yeah. is usually featuring a lot of couch time. Yeah. That's right. Or if you push it for a week, then you take, you know, you're going to, you, your, your body will find that, that balance, you know, um, it used to be this old expression growing up. My, uh, I grew up in rural Pennsylvania and a lot of like DIY construction and that kind of stuff. Um, and people would always say when they're putting in plumbing systems that, you know, the, or, or irrigation systems or anything like that, the water always finds its own level, right. That you kind of water mm. will always even itself out across a big complex system. And, and, um, I think energy expenditure kind of ends up being that way too. It takes a while to adjust, but your body will find its own level. Uh, and it's possible that the increased devotion to fitness and quote unquote calorie burning at, at the workout mm -hmm. has a beneficial effect on your calorie consumption. In other words, the six pack is coming out because yeah. the training is also affecting my dietary habits. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a guess. It would be case by case. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that when people are doing, you know, what, what I'm going to really focus on my fitness and, you know, for this month, usually that includes thinking about your diet too, for most of us, I think. Um, and so, you know, if, if your body's, again, if you think about what your body's used to and what it has adjusted to, if your body is used to being sedentary and you start exercising, it's going to take a while for your body to adjust, but then that becomes the new normal and you adjust. Um, at some point you're going up too high to be able to adjust anymore. That's true. Like the sort of France is not something you can adjust to and do forever and ever and ever you can't. Um, but you know, that person who is exercising all the time and then they push it for that month to prepare for the tour de France or whatever it is. Uh, yeah, their body is kind of going to try to adjust to that. Maybe they'll be up above where they can adjust to, in which case they will have to take a rest period and come back down to that level that, that your body is able to adjust to, uh, but yeah, I think, I think that's how you have to think about the longer time frames. I think that's right. Uh, could that include eating more calories in conjunction with training more and everything's adjusting upward for a, a temporary period of time, I guess. You're, you're, yeah, not getting, well, so that, you're not getting fat and you're not dropping a bunch of weight, but right. you're, you're eating a ton. I, I brought up my son in, our, in my email exchange because like, okay, look, this guy wakes up in the morning and all yeah. he does is eat. And then it finishes the meal and then does a workout and then starts the next meal. And right. there's a lot of muscle mass that he's trying to support too. So maybe that's a two part yeah. question. Like the difference between someone who weighs 200 pounds, solid muscle working out a lot versus someone who's sitting on 200 pounds. Sure. Sure. Well, if, I mean, every 200 pounds of muscle, um, sorry, every, every kilogram of muscle, uh, of fat free mass, I should say that includes organ mass, but every kilogram of fat free mass is 40 kilocalories a day, more or less. Of just okay. you know, if you wanted to so, kind of track it that way. So when you right. when you build 10 pounds of muscle, that's five kilos, let's say, then I I would already expect that your energy expenditure just by your fat free mass going up is going to go up what five kilos at 40 kilocalories a kilo is 200 calories a day. Right. So you go, you can squeeze a snack in there if you've gained five kilos of muscle. Sure. <laughs> a small right. snack, a handful yeah. of MMs. So the constrained model is constrained by body weight. Yeah. Uh, it's a fat free mass adjusted kind of way of thinking about things. Oh, uh, what about the fat? So fat, you can, you can throw fat in there too. And it doesn't really change the model. Fat doesn't really burn many calories. Uh, so fat, yeah, fat, fat's a tiny player. I mean, it's not nothing and it, it creates, it makes hormones. It makes leptin and adiponectin and that kind of thing. So it's not, it's not like just dead weight, but in terms of calories per day, it really doesn't burn much. Oh, so the, the 700 pound people that are uh, on the TV show and in serious metabolic and, and health distress, yeah. are they consuming a, a massive amount of calories to support that 700 pounds or something? Yeah. In fact, you know, people who are obese, uh, people with obesity, you know, it, you know, not only have a lot of fat, but also carry a lot of muscle just to be able to, to stand up and walk. Oh yeah. You no, know? that's right. And so, <laughs> Um, that, that's actually one of the big breakthrough observations in the 1980s, you know, the data wins, uh, they, people were measuring energy expenditures in 
uh, women with obesity and women without. This is the first study to, study to do this. And to test the, what people had long thought to be the case, which is that if you have obesity, it's because you have a slow metabolic rate, right? I mean, that seems to be so intuitive and it seems like it had to be true. And they measure it. Nope, not true. Women, you know, if you, so body size, big, people with more body, people with more cells burn more calories. That's not a surprise, right? An elephant burns more calories every day than a mouse. Has to be true, okay? So that happens within people too. If we look at a bunch of, if we took a big sample of people from tiny to big, the big people burn more calories than the small people. I mean, of, of course, right? And so we have to always sort of look at these things uh, on a kind of, as a, as a function of how big you are. We have to correct for body size. So the obese folks who actually were, of course they're bigger, um, were actually burning more calories than the slim people. But they're all, on this, they're all on the same level when you consider the effect of body size, right? Uh, with a slight uh, adjustment for body composition. So there's a 200 yeah, yeah, yeah. pound when, person. So body size specifically we're saying fat-free mass. So for, fat, for, oh. for a lean mass, for a given lean mass, they're burning the same number of calories. Yeah. That, that's, um, that's another deep breath section here. Mm. I mean, the, 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 the obese person is, is messed up and their metabolic function is messed up. That's what we've long understood. Um, this reminds me of your answer on the email. Your, the insulin-based view of obesity doesn't hold up to scrutiny. Can you talk more about that? Oh, yeah. Uh, so the carbohydrate insulin model for obesity, this really beautiful idea. Um, <laughs> Elegant idea. <laughs> You know, uh, we have this expression in, I think probably all fields of science say the same thing, but certainly as I was getting trained, um, you know, it's a beautiful idea slain by an ugly fact. And I don't know who's, <laughs> I don't know who first said that. Mark Twain did, or somebody. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, and it's this idea that when you eat a meal and particularly when you eat a, a high carbohydrate meal and specifically a high, uh, simple carbohydrate meal that your insulin spikes right? Your body's response to that is a big bolus of insulin that you use, you know, your blood, your insulin levels go way up. Um, and that, that much is definitely true. We, we can watch that happen in a lab easy. Um, and then the next part is, is the mechanism that we think is important, which is that, that insulin, uh, takes the, you know, the, the blood glucose out of your blood. And in fact, as well as, as the fatty acids that are in your blood, and, and parks them into your fat cells. That's what insulin does is it, it, it is a anabolic uh, hormone in the sense that it's taking molecules out of your blood and, and parking them away and building fat cells. Uh, and so then and I'm simplifying here, but, but the idea then is that now your brain is sensing blood that is really, uh, low on blood glucose and fats because you're in that insulin spike has packed them all away. So now you don't have them in your circulating anymore. And even though you've eaten this big meal, your brain senses that you have low fuel store, you know, that, mm -hmm. that the gas tank's empty. And so when your brain says a gas tank's empty, you get hungrier, you get um, tireder, right? Maybe, or you at least have a lower metabolic rate in response to that uh, perceived starvation. Uh, and that, that's, of course, that becomes an ugly cycle because now you're hungry again, now you eat again, now you, you know, sorry. So the idea is that that, that insulin response, the carbohydrate insulin response is responsible for obesity because that's how that's a kind of a runaway snowball towards obesity is is this carbs insulin and now obesity mm -hmm. flow it's all plausible it's all a very possible set of things that could be true <laughs> um and about 10 years ago people were really excited about it you know um i remember when the hadza stuff came out and gary Taubes emailed me about this good calories bad calories and yes we read the book and I got excited about it too. I thought, oh, this is, makes a lot of sense. I have to say, I was always, I didn't quite understand how you could square that with the sort of carbohydrate rich foods and, and meals and diets that, that people like the Hadza eat. <laughs> um, but anyway, that's, but okay. Putting that aside for a moment, it seemed very plausible uh, that it could work. And, and of course, there's so many stories of people, not just stories, but people's real lived experiences are, I cut carbs out of my diet and mm. I did great. I lost so much weight and I'm so much healthier now. And, I, and everybody's so happy. I, I'm happy that that happens for people, right? Um, okay, but now, now we get to the boring part, which is let's actually test to see if that mechanism really works the way that we think it does. 
And so we can do controlled diet studies where we feed people a low fat diet or feed people a low carbohydrate diet, mm -hmm. right? And when you do that in a controlled way, mm -hmm. it doesn't work that, it doesn't work the way the carbohydrate insulin model predicts. You don't get the same insulin response to the low carb versus low fat diets that you you'd expect. You don't get the same fat, uh, changes in, in fat, uh, you know, uh, uh, percentage in your body that you'd expect. Um, there's, there doesn't seem to be any magic to a low carb diet other than the fact that if you cut carbs out of your diet, it's one way to reduce how many calories you eat, right? Same with cutting fat out, you're saying. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we can assign people to a low carb diet. We can assign people to a low fat diet. And this has been done in, in lots of studies now. And uh, it's been, you know, it, the response is, this, is similar. You know, you get people who lose weight on, on either diet. And, you know, the diet that you like, that works best for you, that feels the best for you, will, that, well, that, that's, that's up to you. Uh, that's up, up to you and, and how you're wired and what your environment's like. But it's, you know, there, there's no magic to a low carb diet. And the carbohydrate insulin model specifically as a mechanism Every time it's been tested, as far as I'm aware, it's kind of come up pretty short. Well, I guess backing into it, if you're hungry all the time, then your diet's not working well for you. So in that sense, if you're yeah. pumping a lot of insulin into your bloodstream, we, we know that to be unhealthy. That doesn't seem to be disputed, uh, yeah. but it's, it's sort of like you got to back into this story rather than uh, you get hit head first with this, uh, this, this model, as it's called. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and there's different ways to stay full and, you know, protein and mm. fat make your body feel full for a lot of people that works great. And so, mm. no you know, so if I have a low carb diet and my diet's full of healthy proteins and healthy fats, Hey, I, look, I feel full on less. And, you know, and, and I've made the decision humans, we have these big, wonderful brains that, you know, we have rules that we tell ourselves. And if the rule is I can't eat anything on that side of the menu, gosh, I just made it a whole lot easier to make sure I don't overeat. Right. right. And now I'm, now I'm on the 16, eight plan. So yeah. there goes 16 hours of the day. Cause my rule says I can't eat. I'm going to probably yeah. eat fewer calories. Not yeah. necessarily though, because if I'm, if I'm in the binge mode, cause now I finally get to eat, uh, we're going to just, yeah. we're, we have to answer to Herman at the end of the day, it's going to be tough for us. Yeah. The, the rules are, you know, what rules work for you are going to be a combination of, you know, how your reward system in your brain responds to sugars versus fats or whatever. And, you know, some people really love the structure of hard and fast rules. I love that this is what I know. This is what I eat. This is me. I do this works great for them. Other people kind of chafe at that and don't do as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, this, this gets into the psychology of diet and this is not my specialty. I'm an anthropologist. So I study a lot of human diversity and different, but not in a kind of prescriptive way. So um, what I can tell you as an observer of people across cultures is that people do different things differently. And there is usually not any one size fits all thing. Mm -hmm. um, now, what size works for you? Well, talk, talk to a dietitian or, or, or give it a try yourself. So if we go into extreme diet mode, because we got to get that 10 pounds off before the, the bridesmaid gig. Oof. Yeah, um, good luck. What happens there? Well, if you go too far too fast, right? Uh, then again, we're evolved organisms. Our bodies don't like to lose weight. And, uh, you will, um, especially if you're, when you're feeling like you're starving, your body goes into starvation mode, hmm. pull, you know, cranks your metabolic rate down, right? Those same kind of tools that your body, your body can use to adjust different organ systems and different metabolic yeah. systems. It can just turn them all down. And now you're in trouble right now. Your metabolic rates you're down, tired. you're burning fewer calories than you were before. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, maybe you really were good about cutting a couple hundred calories of your diet out every day, but your body goes, yeah, well, you're also burning a couple hundred calories less now, unbeknownst to you, because I'm, I'm turning it down. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then gosh, now I'm not losing any weight anymore. So it's really hard to do. I think <laughs> you, know, I, I, yeah, well, you said, if I had, you know, cards on the table, the, the zillion dollar bet, um, how would I live forever? And that's a good question. Or well, I hope to 110. What I thought you were gonna say is cards on the table, how do you fix the obesity epidemic? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the answer I think is um, you start with kids mm. because I think that once you get to be 40 and 50 and 60 years old, it's awfully hard to, all the data says you can change and you should try if you're at an unhealthy place in your, in your, in your life, but it's hard. It's just harder. You know, things get less flexible, less dynamic when you're older. Um, even your behaviors get less flexible, right? 
And so uh, I think you got to start with kids because I think if you end up, you know, if you're, if you have a really serious health issue, weight issue, when you're in your fifties, it's harder to fix than if you can address that kid when he's 10 and fix it there. Yeah, I guess if we're extremely out of line, which in, in many cases we are with this ridiculous excess appetite and eating the highly palatable foods and until we're yeah. stuffed and have to undo our belt, belt buckle, we can certainly make all these corrections. And then I guess maybe some, just like the athlete, maybe some recalibration will occur where you drop 10 pounds of fat successfully. And then when you want to go from 10 to 15, that's when you're saying these mechanisms are going to kick in and make it really tough. Yeah, I, I, you know, the, there's a really nice uh, set of papers out recently uh, by Kevin Hall and, and some other folks who've worked on weight loss for a long time. Uh, looking at the physi it's called the physiology of the weight loss state, which is, mm. doesn't, you know, not, not eye catching maybe, but it's a, it's, uh, it was a fun conference I was at uh, back in the before times when you could travel for conferences. And, you know, ju just how your body does recalibrate to a weight loss state and what we do about that and kind of move forward from that. I think that's going to be the next challenge, right? We, we've, we've worked a lot on how do you lose 10% of your body weight if you need mm -hmm. to do that. Um, now the next horizon, I think for a lot of this is how do we keep it off and, or how do we get to the next, the next 5% or, you know, that kind of thing. So the long-term stuff, I think is going to be harder and harder to, to, to well, not harder and harder necessarily, but it's going to be what's next. And just by nature of the fact that you're talking about long-term change, it's going to be harder to investigate because you're going to need long-term studies to do it. Mm. Uh, and so hopefully there's energy and, and uh, funding and, and interest in that kind of stuff. Cause I do think that is the next, the next phase. What about like a, um, a fast one day a week where you're not going to go into survival mode yeah. and that's going to be your, uh, you're going to try to drop some excess calories and then eat normally uh, the other six days or some type of, or, or alternatively an under the radar approach where you consume 50 fewer calories than you burn, even though we have no way of knowing that. Yeah. Um, it seems like that could be a path to fat reduction that would uh, not fly in the face of the, yeah. the your research and, and yeah, all that. No, the, yeah. People have had good, good luck with uh, intermittent fasting or different kinds of fasting approaches. And yeah, I absolutely. If that works for you, um, there's no reason it wouldn't. Uh, the, if you go too fast and too mm. much, you're going to have that response, that, that reaction, that metabolic reaction. But if you can do it in a way that your body doesn't freak out, yeah, you could be okay. Or I suppose going too fast too soon obviously would have that reaction, but uh, I would imagine also uh, eating 200 calories less per day for the next five years, you would probably compensate and burn fewer calories. Yeah, eventually. I mean, it, the other thing is too, if you lose the weight, if you lose fat, oh, you wouldn't expect right. to yeah. see too much of a change in, in, in the oh, expenditure because yeah. fat's pretty quiet. But if you're losing, if any muscle goes along with that, then, you know, now your, your energy expenditure requirements go down too. It's tough. It's tough. That's not going to sell a lot of uh, quick fix weight loss programs, man. Yeah. That's Maybe why I didn't, can, you could call it. It's tough. That's why I didn't write one. <laughs> It's tough. It's tough. Good luck. Here we go. Yeah. But, but, uh, finding the diet that works, I mean, that your, your tagline, find a diet that keeps you satisfied that you enjoy and yeah. is, it keeps you, keeps you, um, you know, well-fed, but is not an excessive amount of calories is, is a big winner there. I think so. And I'm, um, I'm a big believer in human diversity as a, I think it's a strength on all levels of diversity of behavioral and, and, uh, physical and mental diversity. I think it's all good stuff. And, um, we should, why would we want to ignore that? Why, mm -hmm. why wouldn't we want to embrace that when it comes to diet and everything too? Um, you know, diversity is good and, and it's going to, some things are going to work better for some people than others. And I'm also a big believer that, uh, you know, there's a drive to be, we have a drive to be happy and a drive to be content and we should honor that. And if you're doing things that make you just unhappy every day, miserable because of what you're eating or what you're trying to do at the gym, I mean, you're going to have a hard time keeping it up. And mm -hmm. why should you, you know, find things that you enjoy doing. I, I think that there is a lot out there. As soon as we open up our mind and go, Oh, I don't have to eat this particular way. Mm -hmm. I need to follow these principles. Well, now that seems pretty doable. I could find a way that will work within these principles. I don't have to exercise this way. I just need to get moving. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I can find a way that gets me moving mm -hmm. that I like. Right. I think, I hope that that opens doors for people and is a way to kind of, if you have been frustrated, um, 
is a way to kind of get back into it. Right. And, and that, that would include like maybe not centering your life around meals because you're getting more healthy, you're moving more, you're, you're getting good at, at, at burning fat. You're not pumping insulin into your, your blood all day and night. Yeah. And then you don't have, you, you forget about it and you're so busy, you, you, you work through lunch with, with yeah. no, nothing to, you know, no, nothing to show for it negatively. Yeah. Oh man, that was a great uh, follow-up show. I'm, I'm getting clearer now. And I, I think that Tour de France example hits home where sure, of course you can get into your bridesmaid dress and then, um, you know, we, we got to be reasonable and, and have those, have those long-term sites too. Yeah. Yep. That's right. Okay, people go buy the book Burn. It's going to blow your mind. It's a great work. I appreciate you so much, Herman. Thanks for joining us again. And uh, good luck with everything you're doing. Keep it up. Thanks, Brad. It was really fun to talk. Anytime. Dun, 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 dun.